Hello everyone. Welcome to the webinar entitled Conquering the Data Deluge. This webinar is hosted by Infotech Research Group and is part of our series for Canada's Smartest IT Program. Uh, before we get going with the main part of the webinar, I would like to cover a few housekeeping items. The presentations will last about 20 minutes. After that, we'll have uh, time for questions from everyone. Uh, we would like to make this webinar as interactive as possible. However, the phone lines for the attendees will be muted. So please use the chat box and question box located on the right-hand side of your screens to communicate with the administrators and the presentation team. For any technical issues, please use the chat box. And for questions on topics, please use the questions panel. This will enable your questions to go directly to the presenters. We will make the presentation material available to all attendees after the webinar. So that should give you more time to listen rather than concentrate on taking notes. As mentioned, the webinar is part of Canada's Smartest IT program where we may have many partners and a host of volunteer industry experts like Chris and David to educate Canadians on trends and developments related to their lines of business. We will begin with a brief background and context to this program, which was born out of a study of your peers across the country. Then Chris will share some of the fascinating challenges facing NASA and the fascinating ways in which they are addressing those challenges. After that, David will share his insights developed from helping Canadian businesses evolve to meet the challenges of dealing with and leveraging big data. Most of all, we want this webinar to be useful to you, the audience. So send in your questions as we go through, and the experts will give you answers as you need in the Q&A session. So I'd like, now I'd like to introduce the other uh, presenters on this show. Uh, Chris, welcome. Please tell us a little bit about yourself and your background in dealing with big data. Sure. Hi, guys. Uh, this is Chris Natman. Um, my background is uh, I sort of wear a multitude of hats. The first hat that I wear is I'm a senior computer scientist at NASA JPL in Pasadena, California. And basically uh, what I do there is I lead teams of uh, developers that are building open source data management systems for the next generation of NASA Earth Science missions for um, reimbursable projects, including uh, cancer research and informatics work that we have uh, sort of acquired with the National Cancer Institute in the U.S. Uh, and various other sort of activities at JPL. At USC, another hat that I wear, I'm an adjunct assistant professor and I teach uh, two courses, two graduate courses at the university, one in search engines and information retrieval and another in software architecture. And I've been uh, teaching there for about uh, five years and I've been at USC for a long, long time because I got my undergraduate and graduate degrees there. I love USC. But uh, besides that, I also uh, am a strong contributor to the open source community. Uh, I'm a member of the Apache Software Foundation uh, and have contributed to a number of big data technologies there, including Nutch, Hadoop, uh, Tika, and, and, and other uh, activities. So that's a little bit about me. Great. Hey, thanks, Chris. Uh, David, uh, would you please tell us a little bit about some of the work that you've been doing in helping organizations address big data challenges and opportunities, please? Uh, sure, will do, and thanks very much for having me here. Uh, my name is David Corrigan. I'm based in uh, Toronto, Canada, in IBM's Software Development Lab, and I'm responsible for uh, product strategy for a brand called Infosphere, which includes our big data technologies. In my role, I've had the pleasure of working with dozens and, and even hundreds of clients on big data challenges, um, some of them right here in the Canadian uh, marketplace. Uh, so I'll, uh, later on in this call, I'll share some of those uh, client use cases uh, and examples of where you can utilize this new technology to, to solve new uh, business problems uh, for your organizations. Thanks, David. So now, actually, as we move forward into the main part of the presentation, um, as you're all aware, you know, these days we're generating more data in more forms from more sources than we have ever before. And you know, statistics from many sources are available that support this view. And some of the ones that I like to use show that you know, they give you numbers such as 40 exabytes, that's four times you know, 10 to the 19. Uh, bytes of unique new information is generated worldwide every year okay? this is, uh, nowadays. The amount of new technical information is doubling every two years and so on. So the really key issue here really is that 80% of all this new data growth is unstructured content. 
And we are adding new sources and devices every day that create even more data um, from this. This slide gives you a sense of the types of volumes of transactions taking place daily. You know, this ex exponential growth of data is really placing substantial demands on the organization's strategy and approach for managing and analyzing the vast amounts of information that's available out there. And by the way, you know, just apart from the challenge as organizations and the customers become, you know, sort of more tied and increasingly tied together in real time, organizations will be responsible for the compliance, reliability, and availability of all this information, and particularly, you know, 85% of all this digital information out there. So this really raises the questions about how organizations can get their arms around this volume of data, and uh, how do they know what's out there and how to use it. Combined with all that, we have a degree of instability and increasing competitive and competitiveness in the world that has got sort of business leaders asking for better insights, especially from all the data and information we are collecting and storing. You know, this, there is increasing pressure and opportunity to mine the data that we have and to gain insights and provide some sort of competitive advantage for all this. And this is where, you know, things like business analytics and business intelligence come in. And the capability really offers the opportunity to sift through vast amount of data, slice and dice it, and start to identify relationships between the disparate data and come up with some actionable insights. Um, you know, obtaining insights from data for business advantage is not new. You know, some organizations have been doing it for many, many years. And, you know, research has shown that high-performing organizations consistently use information and analyze that to create insights that impact their top and bottom line. You know, here are a number of uh, well-documented examples of organizations that have been building um, sort of data analytical capabilities and using those insights from that data to get some sort of business advantage. Um, you know, I won't go through all these case studies, but um, they're all available. You can Google them, and uh, you'll actually be able to see how innovative some of these companies have been in their use of that data and getting the insights from the data. Uh, what I would like to do, though, is to give you a sense of um, what is involved in actually accessing that data and um, mining and, uh, and mining it and getting some insights. You know, at the bottom of the screen, you'll see the data. You know, there's basically a number of layers that one has to go through. And to enable these you know, actionable insights from this data, you actually have to go through, you have to have the capabilities across all these layers, um, and you have to address them uh, appropriately. To create meaningful insights, one needs to bring together data from many different sources so that you can start making connections, finding patterns, and spotting trends that wouldn't otherwise uh, be apparent to you. So that's really at the bottom layer there. Okay. Then you need to clean, restructure, or transform that data so that it can be sliced and diced. Okay. Data mining engines are then used to really slice and dice the data further to address the business queries and the information is presented in a form that people can really make sense out of it. And there's a whole host of tools out there to uh, of various capabilities and strengths that are out there that will help you actually do that. And lastly, the insights that enable the action at the point of need in the appropriate form and you know, uh, have, have to be uh, sort of made available to the people. Okay. So ultimately, the challenge is really in capturing, organizing, and managing the data to create business value. I will now ask Chris to share some of his experiences in how NASA approaches the challenges of collecting, processing, using the vast amounts of data, and how they create value out of it. So over to you, Chris. Thanks a lot. Um, yeah, so so basically what I, what I, I'm sorry. Yeah. Sorry, yeah, Chris. Yeah. Sorry. So we're going to... I like it real time. <laughs> In real time. That's it. So everyone, you're going to see some questions on your screen. And please choose one. And we will wait a minute before we present the results.
Okay, folks, so we'll be closing the poll in a few seconds. Results on your screen now. So it seems the major point, point, pain points are the complexity of the applications and I would assume the lack of integration of the systems that you have out there and just basically handling the large amounts of data out there. So this actually is a great segue to for Krishna. Um, so Chris, if you could share some of your experiences in how NASA approaches these challenges in collecting the data. And uh, mining. No problem at all. Uh, thanks for handing it over. Uh, so yeah, so now let me uh, put on my face here. <laughs> um, uh, so actually, those, those, poll, uh, those poll questions were, were really appropriate at least for um, the the types of challenges that we're dealing with at NASA a lot. And specifically, I think that the challenges I'll talk about here kind of deal uh, a lot with the explosive data growth, which I was happy to see, you know, sort of pulled well as sort of a pain point, as well as um, scarce IT skills, and I'll try and touch on them sort of right now. So when if you came to me at JPL or NASA and you asked me, you know, well, what are, what are the issues that you're dealing with? I could come up with about four. In fact, I did. That's what's on these slides right here. <laughs> the, the first thing that's sort of really interesting to me is a project, um, an international project that we're involved with uh, called the, the Square Kilometer Array. Um, it's an uh, astronomy, radio astronomy instrument, uh, and it will have sort of a deep impact in the astrophysics world. Uh, the SK is the next generation instrument that they're building. Uh, they'll either build in one of two places or perhaps in a multitude of places, but the two main sites they're looking at to build it right now uh, are Australia and South Africa, and their countries and ministries are investing a lot of dollars in, in basically trying to figure out how to build this next generation instrument. The, the dishes uh, that they're going to put uh, down in one of those sites will eclipse over a square kilometer of, of actual area, so it'll be huge up-looking dishes that will image the sky like never before. And like never before means uh, lots and lots of data that are being generated. In fact, some have estimated that it will be at a clip of about 700 terabytes per second when they actually build it, which is why uh, many of the uh, science uh, ministries and people that are doing research in computer science uh, and data intensive systems, hardware, uh, they, you know, we don't even have the technology right now or, or even the theoretical understanding of how to deal with that how to deal with 700 terabytes a second coming off the wire. Um, and then when you start talking about having to keep that, that information around, because of course, uh, you know, astronomy uh, and long-term research folks uh, are moving away from sort of a uh, principle of the, the sky as the archive <laughs> into more of a, hey, if I keep all this data around, I can keep researching it, I can kind of keep trying to data mine it and, and understand sort of what's there. It's really interesting in that. A lot of, uh, the second bullet, a lot of times uh, what will happen to me at, at JPL or whatever is someone will come to my team, um, this happens with our external collaborators as well, as well it, it'll be like Joe scientists and they'll come to us and they'll say, hey, you know, we've got, we've got uh, some type of algorithm, some type of analytics, uh, you know, that we're doing on this data set. It could be a remote sensing data set uh, generated by, by one of NASA's uh, large number of Earth science remote sensing missions, could be a planetary data set, um, uh, could be a data set for uh, pediatric intensive care. And what they'll do is they'll say, look, we've been researching this, we've been building scripts in MATLAB, in R, or in IDL, some interactive you know, type of data analysis language. And you know what? I don't want to change those scripts. But you know, I've got an issue. I need to run a decade's worth of data through it, um, uh, through these scripts. And I need it done like next week because I'm writing a paper and I need the data around for that paper. <laughs> and I need to figure out and do my analysis on it. And it would be too hard for me to kind of develop my own sort of piece together, uh, you know, group of software to do this. And so we get that question a lot. Uh, for example, a recent area that we got it was on the Western Snow Hydrology Project with Dr. Tom Painter for the National Climate Assessment uh, contribution that we're making from NASA. And, uh, you know, I will talk in sort of the next slide about uh, some, some, of the, some of the ways that we're approaching and dealing with this technology-wise. But that's just another of the challenge. And, uh, and I would actually sort of chalk that up, too, to sort of the delineation between the science, or at least the physical and natural science community that you see a lot, and the IT community, or the people that are doing computer science. And a lot of times, 
we see kind of the opposite there. Not necessarily, um, well, we see it in sort of both directions. We see the lack of IT skills a lot on the sort of physical or science side, uh, you know, where folks have read a programming book and, you know, they think they know how to integrate it into a big data system and, and have distributed systems knowledge. So a lot of the scientists are realizing that they need help in doing that. And then we see it on the IT side, where the IT uh, people that are working on the project, they just, you know, they don't have knowledge of the physical or natural science, uh, you know, elements that sort of deep domain knowledge that you need to really get what's going on. So we see sort of a meeting of the minds in the middle, and that's, that's a challenge, I think, for people that are working in the big data space, both from a technology perspective and also just from a perspective of building systems that people actually care about and will use. The third bullet um, there is basically talking about some recent work that we've been doing at NASA um, to sort of reformulate our um, to reformulate our our remote sensing data sets to make them more easily comparable uh, to to climate models and climate model outputs. Um, and so uh, basically, NASA remote sensing data sets are stored in sort of a variety of different formats. They're disparate. Uh, they're stored in different locations. Climate model outputs, such as those that are being used for the next intergovernmental panel on climate change, the IPCC assessment, which is basically the report um, that goes into generating people's understanding of what the world will be sort of doing climate-wise over the next, you know, decade to 100-year projections. Um, as it turns out, if you can find ways to sort of take the remote sensing data from NASA and to better sort of use it to help compare the models that are out there, the climate models that people are making, the predictions that the models actually make can get better. And um, so this is sort of a big ch data challenge from the perspective of there being lots of data, there, it being distributed across the world, there being these different organizations uh, that sort of are responsible for the long-term stewardship of that data, NASA on the remote sensing side, NOAA in the US as well as another organization that's participating in that. And then on the um, on the climate modeling side, we see a lot of the DOE uh, uh, folks uh, and, and as an organization, a lot of the DOE labs that are participating in that, specifically the Earth System Grid uh, folks there. So it's sort of, you know, federated, multi-organizational, large voluminous amounts of data. How do we get it together and compare it? That's another one of the big uh, data challenges that I'm interested in. And then finally, we've had this problem for a long time uh, with respect to the planetary, but you know, how do, we, how do we catalog and archive all of NASA's planetary science data? It's being done right now through NASA's planetary data system in a largely distributed fashion, um, uh, basically broken down by science discipline, sort of distributed nationally throughout the U.S., at universities and at various NASA sites. And a lot of times people want to come and they want to search across the whole archive or they want to find uh, data, you know, that they're particularly interested about, like rings data from Saturn or atmosphere atmosphere data or data related to comets and things like that or small bodies. And um, so what they'll do is they'll sort of try and come to some initial clearinghouse page and then they'll get down into the actual sort of uh, domain specific or data specific, uh, you know, information and then it'll be sort of a challenge for them to figure out, well, where do I go from here? How do I, how do I process or mine this information? What should I do with it? And a lot of that has been sort of de developed in a domain-specific or distributed way. And so we're trying to think of solutions to sort of better engineer that uh, and to better sort of provide the ability to sort of see what, what information is out there across NASA's planetary data system across all of their archive. So see, these are some of the challenges that I'm interested in and some of the challenges that I think are representative of what people have to do in the big data space uh, nowadays. You can skip to the next slide. Um, so some of the, I don't want to present problems or challenges without talking about answers. <laughs> um, the answer that I've been primarily involved with over the past 10 years has been the development of a technology called Apache OODT. Um, ODT uh, is a project that was originally pioneered at NASA and we spent the last few years transitioning it to the Apache Software Foundation. Uh, Apache is the sort of uh, de facto place in a lot of cases that people go for open source software. Uh, it receives a large number of contributions from external organizations, from contributors around the world, from the major technology companies, IBM, uh, one of them, uh, but also uh, other companies like Oracle, Google. Uh, a lot of them have uh, developers that are actually paid to work on open source 
Um, and then additionally, folks that aren't paid that just sort of coalesce and come together around very interesting technologies that are being built. You'll hear a lot about Hadoop in sort of the big big data space. Uh, you know, when you talk about open source technologies for that, ODT is another technology that's in that space and very complementary to Hadoop. It's basically a set of tools and software components to build out data systems. Originally, sort of science data systems, but now sort of more generically any type of data systems. It's not meant to be turnkey. Uh, it's not something that you just deploy ODT and then suddenly your data is, you know, starting to be munged and mined and things like that. But what it does represent is sort of the codification of a number of processes um, that we found effective over the years in system engineering these types of, of, of uh, data systems at NASA. So it'll, it'll allow you to more easily define metadata for the types of data that you're collecting um, to sort of identify what metadata you'd like to catalog and archive, to process the data, to place it on disk, um, to put it on a particular storage device, be it a cloud, be it your own sort of private infrastructure. ODT helps you with all of those things. And it also helps you address a lot of the challenges that we talked about or that I talked about on the last slide, which is it allows you to sort of easily integrate science algorithms unobtrusively. So, you know, not make you actually have to take that IDL algorithm and then rewrite it in a different programming paradigm. ODT exploits the fact that um, scientists aren't going to uh, want to change. <laughs> and, and, you know, we see this a lot sort of in the IT space in general besides science data. It exploits the fact that they won't want to be the change and that they're going to be the primary maintainers of their algorithms. So what ODT tries to do is allow the algorithms not to change, but to sort of easily wrap them and uh, integrate them into sort of a production pipeline environment. Um, one other sort of unique capability of ODT that I'll just mention that, that I'm particularly interested in is that a large number of contributions from the search engine community have gone into sort of better informing ODT. When I was a committer on Nutch before we spun Hadoop out into its own project, um, there were a number of things that really interested me about what we were doing with large-scale web search at the time. Crawling for one of uh, for one of them, file identification, parsing of files, language identification, all those types of things. So eventually, we spun out some of those capabilities into a project called Tika, which is a technology, big data technology you might hear about for content detection and analysis. And a number of the properties of Tika and the abilities of Tika have been integrated into ODT um, to allow sort of files to get automatically crawled and archived for their metadata to be extracted. Um, for that information to make files more easily available for search, for integration with other sort of downstream toolkits like MATLAB or R for analysis, for integration with GIS systems, and a number of other things. So ODT uh, is being deployed operationally not just at NASA, um, but at a number of other organizations. Uh, we've used it uh, with our work on the NASA Earth Science missions, the Next Generation Decadal ones, but we've also used it at the National Institutes of Health and the National Cancer Institute. We have a number of projects there. Uh, specifically the Early Detection Research Network, where we're using ODT to build out sort of federated data systems to help share information for scientists, uh, all the way to sort of lab analytics systems to help them capture uh, information as it's coming or streaming off of the actual instrument, uh, like mass spectrometer and so forth. Um, other folks that are contributing include universities, uh, uh, children's hospitals, and so forth, specifically Children's Hospital Los Angeles, Astronomy community has been adopting it with some of our work on, on the SKA effort, specifically the South Africans. Um, and then the sort of final thing I want to touch on is just in general, whether it's OET or not, or, or whatever you know type of technology you're using to do big data management, um, I'd encourage you to go look in open source, and I'd encourage you to go look uh, at Apache. And why? Well, Apache is a place where the projects that are there are sort of actively maintained and managed. There's a governance process associated with it. A lot of times you'll go to SourceForge or Google Code or whatever, and there's 160,000 projects there. And you're not exactly sure sort of how active those projects are or what's going on. A lot of times responsiveness is sort of a measurement of the health of the community. Well, Apache sort of has an active sort of triage process and an active process for curating and making sure their community is much helped with less than 100 projects basically live there. Um, but a lot of those 100 projects are some of the de facto technologies you know, in their space, the Apache web server, you know, it's got you know, more than 50% of the market for, for web, uh, in the web space for serving up web pages. Tomcat, one of the de facto technologies for JTBE. Um, Solar and we've seen some of the de facto search technologies and Hadoop, you know, which you'll hear about sort of when you think about big data. 
And, uh, you know, again, it's Apache differs from other open source communities. It's, it provides sort of a structure for active growth. So when you're thinking about your big data uh, technologies and solutions, uh, you know, don't, don't necessarily think about um, locking into a particular vendor. Have sort of an open mind and an open hat. And if that turns to open source, I'd encourage you guys to look at Apache. It's something that um, I think we found particularly effective, uh, at least in JPL and NASA. And I think that's it. Great. Thank you, Chris. It's um, always fascinating to learn what NASA is doing, not just at the frontiers of space, but also at the frontiers of IT there. So um, actually, looking at the time, we'd like to now move on to uh, David and ask David to share some of his insights um, in dealing with big data. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you. And that was fascinating stuff from Chris. Uh, the first thing I'll, I'll say is you know, certainly we agree that the Apache open source distribution is, is really a great place to start and a foundation for what a lot of people are, are looking at as big data. Uh, I'll cover this on the next slide, but the notion of big data is first and foremost a type of data and a problem set that organizations are, are facing. Secondarily, we'll talk about the technology that needs to be applied, and certainly Hadoop's part of that mix, but there are other technologies uh, as well. Where I'd like to start is, what does a big data platform do? What are the use cases that we see out in the industry? Um, uh, where big data technology, be it Hadoop or other new technologies, uh, you know, or even massive parallel process and warehouses need to be applied. Here are the general five criteria, and I'll go through some specific examples. Um, so firstly, analyzing a variety uh, of information, as we covered at the start of this webcast, Data is growing, and of course we're talking about big data, so it may leave you with the implication that we're talking about a volume issue here. It's just as much a variety issue, in that data is coming in many different structures, many different formats, it may be unstructured, and it needs to be analyzed. Uh, in some cases, it's the combination of various data sets together that yields new analysis. And the type of use cases we see organizations tackling with big data technology are typically use cases where there's some combination of that data and in use cases where trying to force all of that data into one schema and one structure um, may be too slow or too much overhead to yield a result. So one example of this would be social media analysis. We see a number of organizations, and I've worked with Canadian organizations across um, you know, many different industries, that are looking to analyze sentiment, sentiment towards their products or customer sentiment and loyalty, and looking at social media data for their customers, so Facebook, Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, et cetera, as potential clues as to the sentiment towards products, the sentiment towards you know, a particular um, organization, uh, potentially uh, could yield a retention uh, issue. Uh, in order to analyze that huge amount of information, uh, you first need to be able to, to bring in you know, the, all of those various information sources, understand you know, who you're looking for, so resolving identities uh, of customers, and then understanding uh, across that variety of different data sets what the sentiment may be. Uh, often, uh, you know, sentiment is buried within text, the 140 characters that you can uh, post or tweet, for example. Um, and there have been many examples you know, of organizations, for example, in uh, retail, uh, in packaged goods, that have used sentiment analysis for, um, for those of you that are familiar with uh, sun chips, um, they actually used social media and sentiment analysis to understand that there was a customer um, issue with the noise and the, the crinkliness, I guess, of their potato chip bags. They discovered that through social media analytics. Second category, analyzing information in motion. Uh, Chris talked a lot about large volumes of data and how much of that data was, was coming off the network uh, each day. Sometimes a big data problem may be a data in motion problem. So it isn't just about storing all of that information. What if you could analyze it as it was streaming off networks or through other information streams, figure out particular types of insight, and perhaps not even store all of that data at all? A particular example, and one close to home, we've worked with the University of Ontario uh, Institute of Technology, and uh, they have a, uh, a program in place uh, using IBM's technology for streaming analytics 
uh, which they've placed into uh, several hospitals um, around the world, and as well as uh, Sick Kids Hospital uh, here in Canada, for uh, neonatal analysis. So analyzing streaming information for various, um, you know, patient monitors, EKG monitors, etc., correlating that information, and by doing so having the ability to potentially detect issues uh, with patients up to 24 hours earlier and intervene uh, for positive outcomes. A very powerful use case. Uh, another driver, of course, for information in motion, and in fact some of the government agencies that we've worked with, if you think about things like video surveillance, et cetera, when uh, the volume of data that you need to store, let's say you're doing video surveillance, quite a bit of it, it is a, a, a camera shot of nothing. Uh, you only need to actually start recording and analyzing when there's something happening or there's something moving on the screen. Um, so analyzing the data in motion to even know when you want to do further drill down analysis, uh, another use case uh, that we've seen for information in motion. We've seen it in the commercial sector as well with telecommunications companies doing real-time call detail record analysis and they'll know you're a valuable customer and we dropped one of your phone calls, let's send you a note and a retention offer or some kind of discount uh, about that. Uh, Chris did a very good job of talking about analyzing extreme volumes of information and of course that's, that's a big part of big data, that's why we call it big data. It isn't just about volume, that's why I started with the other two, but certainly that's a big part of it. Um, you know, another example and, and the way I've seen most organizations characterize this is when you can get a better answer by analyzing more data. So if you look at things that you're doing today, talk to Canadian banks, for example, about uh, risk management and fraud detection, often they use subsets of data in order to detect that. Could you get a better answer if you used all of the available data? That's a potential use case for this big data technology. We've worked with a wind turbine manufacturer called Vestas, does the exact same thing. They uh, offer a service to utility companies to help them place wind turbines for optimal location. And that isn't necessarily the windiest spot from a maintenance point of view. Uh, using um, you know, traditional technologies, they were able to have a precision in the uh, one to five square kilometer range. By analyzing all of the data using big data technology that they had available, which is, is now growing to six petabytes of information, they're able to get that down to about 10 square meters. So an order of magnitude better uh, answer. A final uh, use case I'll highlight is discovery and experimentation. What if you could take the data you have in traditional structured systems <clears throat> and potentially experiment or see if there's new uses for that data? Again, I've seen quite a bit of this within financial services and taking traditional structured data and looking to see if there's some new use for that information. And often that yields new products or services. So for example, by mining through transactions, could I start to understand as a bank, uh, give another financial services example, uh, how some of my customers stack up against other customers and even offer that as an informational service or maybe even a for fee service to say, if you'd like to know how you stack up against other customers who are similar to you, then we can offer that to you as a service. Now let's go to the next slide and we'll talk a little bit about what does this mean from a technology implication. Um, the first point I'll make on this slide, um, and really the overarching point, is big data is not a silo. It is not a single technology. Um, as much as there's a lot of press around uh, Hadoop, um, you know, which, which Chris mentioned as well, big data is many technologies. And we think of big data as an ecosystem or a platform. Certainly Hadoop is part of that. And, and we're you know, contributors to and, and supporters of the open source uh, Apache Hadoop movement. There's many things that we've added uh, as IBM uh, on top of that, you know, to help make that, um, you know, enterprise strength for some of the use cases that I just discussed. Stream computing is another component of this. Uh, stream computing being a technology that uh, IBM developed, um, you know, and stream computing and analytics. Uh, data warehousing is also part of this. Uh, structured data can be large. Um, massive parallel processing warehouses absolutely uh, are big data technology and certain use cases require structured uh, information analysis and integrating that information across um, all of those various systems and from various sources is part of uh, big data and the big data platform as well. Of course, surrounded by and complemented by common application development and systems management and the typical enterprise class type of things that you would uh, expect. 
And when you think about big data as an ecosystem, think about the analytic applications uh, that will be using this as well. And that's very important in taking this from you know, a niche and beginning technology into something that's mainstream. If we're talking about customer sentiment analysis, what's the functional application that marketers will be using to understand that? And it's the analytic applications, uh, some of which you know, IBM develops with Cognos and SPSS and others, and quite a few of them are contributed by our partners. Um, think about it that way. Those are the entry points into these big data technologies and, and very much you know, how to utilize uh, these big data technologies uh, to generate insight um, for your organization. So big data, don't think of it as one technology. It's many technologies and really an ecosystem. Uh, and also think about those use cases. Uh, that would be my, my main advice. There are many different types of uh, use cases that you can address with big data. Um, think about the use case first and then the application of technology uh, to follow. Thank you. Thanks, David. Uh, thanks for that uh, very useful insights and advice there. And one of my big takeaways was the framework that you provided to think about big data and not just to think in terms of the technology or single structure areas, but think of the whole holistic view uh, across the, uh, the big data sources and platforms. Um, we have, I, I know we've gone over a little bit uh, of our allotted time here. However, for those of you who want to remain uh, on the line, we've received a few questions that we'd like uh, to put to our uh, presenters to answer. So uh, for those of you who are unable to stay on, we will be sending you an email later on with a link to the presentation. And there will also be a recording of the presentation on YouTube uh, that you can access. Um, I would like, the first question is actually for you, Chris. Um, has there been any work with OGC web service standards to integrate GRIB, the GRIB, NetCDF, and other climate meteorological data, for example, using tiling service, coverage services, etc.? Wow, ask an easy one to start out with. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, yeah, you know, some of the work actually uh, that, that we've done in, in the area I'm, I'm aware of is um, uh, there's there's a lot of great work that's going on in the, in the NetCDF community um, at Unidata, at NCAR. We work with them at NASA a lot. Specifically technology-wise, um, uh, the NetCDF Java library is something that I'm intimately familiar with, and I've been trying to lead an effort to integrate um, the NetCDF Java library, which understands HDF, various formats of it, and then and NetCDF science uh, data formats into the Apache Tika library because Tika, I you know, not only is it a niche I like to scratch, and I was one of the co-progenitors of it, but it's just it's I think the right place for that type of technology to go. And what Tika will do is it'll take those files and decimate them, and basically extract out the text, uh, you know, and the science data as well as the metadata from them using the NetCDF Java library. And so I've been involved in a lot of efforts to do that, and then to take that work and to integrate it back into ODT so that we could basically just drag and drop files. Um, uh, uh, science data files and, and get them sort of understood by these big data technologies. Solar is also using similar technology in their extracting request handler. But additionally, beyond that, uh, uh, another thing that I'm really interested in is GDAL, uh, uh, the GDAL library, and it's an open source technology that pretty much understands all of those uh, those science data formats, in, and at least to some level, but additionally all of the GIS data formats as well and a lot of the OGC uh, compliant ones. And so I had started an effort, uh, it, I think the issue was like Tika 605 to integrate the GDAL library and the Java bindings into Tika, but um, it stalled a little bit and I'd, I'd love some help or if anyone's interested in it, you know, you can coalesce around that issue, but yeah, that's, that's what I'm aware of and there is work going on. Great, thanks Chris. Uh, David, did you have any perspective you wanted to share on that question? No, nothing additional. <laughs> okay, in that case, we have a question for you then, David. And this one is, can, can lessons learned in big data be used for metadata extraction and streaming geospatial analytics, brokerage services, e.g. data and web services, using OGC standards, 
to support applications in health, energy, or climate? What is the maturity of big data systems for these use case domains? Wow, yeah, your audience certainly gets right to the heart of the questions, don't yeah, they? Yeah, they know um, that stuff, huh? Yeah, they certainly do. Let me see if I can extract some parts of this. <laughs> the, fir the first part of the question that I took was, are there some best practices around metadata and extraction, and what do you see in the, in the big data world? Um, so a short answer to that would be yes, um, there certainly are. One of the things that uh, we see our clients asking us is to say, well, if big data is in a silo, and it is a part of my enterprise, then how can I leverage some of the technologies that I have in place for information management? And I'll get to um, you know, business process management and integration uh, in a second. Uh, in other words, how does big data play with the stuff that I have? Um, so if I'm already using technologies for information integration and metadata management and business glossaries, then can big data work with those technologies? Um, that's been a big driver for us and part of our strategy, in fact, is, is integrating big data uh, within the other products in, in the InfoSphere brand, which are integration and governance uh, technologies for metadata management and integration, et cetera. Um, Again, because some of, sometimes, and, and in some cases, you're actually looking to leverage the technologies that you have in place to load some of the, the data that you have or already have access to into big data. Now, obviously, it's about new uh, information sources as well. And with that, you know, there are obviously new capabilities uh, that are needed for metadata and capabilities, and some of which even Chris mentioned uh, you know, in his presentation for, for some of those non-traditional and other sources as well. And that's something that we continue to evolve uh, towards and is certainly part of our strategy. Now, the second part of the question I took was, so, you know, business processes. Um, and, you know, um, you know what's, the, what's the thought or some of the integration there with, uh, you know, BPM-type technology? Um, big data uh, technology in the way that we see the market adopting it is largely um, to drive particular insights. So it's for analysis uh, and discovery and experimentation. Um, now, how that data is then shared um, you know, becomes a question. Um, what we've often seen is that there may be integration with business process. Um, so I gave some streaming analytics uh, examples. Often as you're analyzing streams of data, what you want to do is intervene uh, in real time as well. It's not just about sifting through the data and then storing it. Um, and in that case, you know, sending alerts or having connection points to BPM technologies to, to actually impact and change a business process, be it if you, say, detect uh, in real time through a stream that a fraud may be happening. We need to act on it and actually maybe prevent the transaction from going through. Um, so, yeah, those capabilities you know, are certainly there. In some cases, um, it may be integration between the big data technologies and other technologies. Um, you know, um, that could be master data management, um, you know, integration, et cetera, which in turn are integrated with many of the enterprise business processes. So if I learn that uh, some insight by sifting through uh, big data about a customer that he's likely to leave us, well, perhaps that's the type of insights that gets manifested in my warehouse and perhaps a master data management system, and through that, it may power and have different outcomes on business processes. Like the next time that customer calls, we're going to do something different. Um, hopefully that addressed all the aspects of that, that multifaceted question. Great. Thanks, David. Uh, Chris, did you want to share any perspectives there? Okay. I think in that I case, that. Uh, we have a question for both of you here. Um, what kind of algorithms are used to do real-time predictive analysis? So, Chris, would you like to take that first? Sure. Um, so, it really depends on the domain. <laughs> uh, uh, for example, I know uh, recently we've been doing some work in pediatric um, intensive care. And what they're trying to do there for decision support and predictive analysis is to understand how patient characteristics um, map to outcomes. So, you know, depending on their characteristics while they stayed in the hospital, you know, what their blood pressure looked like, what their temperature looked like, did they live or die? That's a very simple question, you know, that they can answer. Um, it, it doesn't necessarily trans translate directly into, you know, um, uh, changes in uh, sort of application of of medicine or techniques to change that, but it's at least something that they want to understand. The types of algorithms that they build are largely dependent on the data sets. So a lot of those data sets that we're dealing with in pediatric intensive care are data sets that are amenable to clustering um, and aggregation. 
So a lot of the algorithms that they build are, for instance, trying to bucket patients based on those characteristics into different buckets automatically. In the case that I just mentioned, like live or die, yeah, uh, you know, mortality. And so they'll build kind of clustering algorithms for that. Climate is an entirely different beast. The data is a lot more voluminous. It's not necessarily amenable to splits and aggregation and things like that. And the types of analysis that they're doing is more long-term and uh, predictive. Uh, so I'd, I'd say that in general, uh, a number of different approaches, and it, and it depends on the domain. I'd agree with you there, Chris. Um, you know, what, what I'd add to it is that the demand that we see from the market and where the customer interest is, um, it, number one, it, it is implying predictive analytics to big data. Uh, predictive analytics, there are many classes of analytics um, you know, that we see, and predictive certainly one of them, where we've seen you know, a fair amount of demand. Um, and that's exactly what drives, again, our big data strategy of, of including various analytic engines with our big data uh, capability or platform, um, because that is the primary purpose uh, that we see organizations driving towards. Now, what they're predicting varies you know, widely, uh, obviously by industry, but even you know, within industry, it's by use case. Um, where we focus is building some analytic accelerators. Um, so, you know, Chris had mentioned some ideas of accelerators, um, and, and uh, you know, around um, you know uh, the medical and uh, healthcare areas. Um, you know, others that we've seen and, and ones that we build. I, I talked about telecommunications and uh, you know call detail record handling. Well, actually, having predictive analysis of well, when would a a problem with a call lead to a, a potential a customer churn issue versus, you know, you know what, it probably isn't a potential issue. And being able to predict those types of outcomes is something that we see you know, within the telecommunications industry. Just as one example, um, an area where there's, there's an, a fair amount of demand. Now, here's the interesting thing. I think it's uh, from an organization's point of view. So if I take my vendor hat off and I put a client hat on, I think it would be important to work with you know, a distribution of vendor where there are these analytic engines. Uh, secondly, it's important if there are accelerators there around predictive analytics. But I should always remember, um, in order to in order to you know, make this personal and, and my own intellectual property, each organization is going to have a different idea of what a, um, a predictive indicator of a customer leaving them will be. We're in a new phase here with a new technology around big data and predictably and like other waves of IT, it's going through that wave of adoption of it'd be great if I could simply manage the data and do very basic insights from it and then moving from that to what if I could apply some predictive models. It's getting to the point where organizations are saying, well, hang on, I'm not just going to compete by having this. I'm going to compete by having a better model than the telco down the street and the telco in another province, et cetera. Um, so it's always important for organizations to remember the tooling and the ability to tweak those algorithms themselves is just as important as the technology because ultimately those things are their own intellectual property. Great. Thank you. Um, there's actually another question for you here. How can you organize the team that actually tries to make sense of all the data in a business area? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, firstly, um, like any enterprise project, so it probably sounds like I'm repeating things that we all uh, had, you know, thought of, you know, ten years ago at warehouses or, or enterprise business process management. But don't think of this as just an IT project. It's IT and business. So if we're going to make sense of the data, it's always the business people that understand what sense means, um, you know, in terms of being able to do something with it, um, you know, making sense of the data and what we have seen. The, the promise of big data technology is this notion of discovery and experimentation. You know, I, 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 as a business person, I have a hypothesis that if I could analyze not just, you know, uh, 10 traditional fields that I have in my warehouse, but if I could add in these three other data sources that I could get more accurate at predicting customer churn. Can I? Well, you can use sometimes big data technology to, to prove that hypothesis and to discover, well, what new questions can I ask um, from a business point of view? Uh, the second thing I'll mention is from an IT perspective, we've seen a rise in a role called the data scientist. Um, so someone who understands the data, obviously it's an IT person, but they have a very good business acumen and they work with the business to 
drill down and understand the correlations uh, you know, within the data and to, you know, to essentially prove those hypotheses. And yes, there is an advantage to combining data in these various ways. All of this does have a technology implication as well. And again, it's something that drives our product strategy. You must be able to visualize and experiment uh, with this big data as well. It's not just a platform for, for processing it, but in, and it doesn't have a face. It has to have a face. Uh, and it's the face that, uh, you know, with this visualization capability that big data, or data scientists, excuse me, um, you know, would use uh, to work with the business and understand what new questions can we ask. Thanks, David. Um, Chris, we have a, we've actually received a number of questions that are similar in nature, so I'm going to combine them together for you. Um, how do you describe the data scientist's role at NASA? <laughs> Very carefully. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's um. It's something, you know, it seems to be a combination of, of computer scientists that have actually, I think, taken the time and the discipline to learn the domain uh, that they're working in, the physical science domain or, you know, the business or IT domain or uh, whatever domain that they're building software solutions for to manage the data, um, to understand it, understand the different use cases for it and so forth. Folks that have kind of bridged that gap, but not everyone does it, and that's fine. You don't have to. Um, you know, that's why there's delineation of roles on a team and so forth. But the folks that actually did bridge the gap, you know, they're working in earth science and they learned hyperspectral remote sensing, you know, for instance. Or they're working in pediatric intensive care and they picked up a book, you know, on clinical treatments or outcomes and things like that. Or they actually wanted to understand, you know, what, what some of those requirements, you know, are responsible for. Um, it, that would be sort of the way that I would describe uh, you know, the data scientists. Uh, they're not necessarily sort of super well learned, uh, you know, they don't necessarily need a bunch of big degrees and, and things like that. A lot of times they're folks that, you know, have a, a great knowledge of math or applied science and things like that. Um, and just sort of, I think, the wherewithal to sort of make, make, that distinct, make that distinction between the folks that sort of receive software requirements and cannot only speak in sort of this terminology and, you know, on the other side of the fence, the people that only really understand their domain but they don't really understand sort of the principled practices and approaches to building data systems and computer science. Um, so, so that would be the way that I would describe it. Great. Thanks, Chris. Actually, we've got many questions still continuing to come in. So uh, looking at the time, maybe we'll ask one or two more and uh, bring the webinar to a conclusion here. Um, what kind of schema do companies use to analyze big data? Um, how about you, David? Do you want to answer that? Uh, sure. I, I guess I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll give many answers to this. Um, firstly, <laughs> if we're talking about um, a variety uh, use case, where we're trying to analyze a variety of information and some of the technologies that we mentioned, so uh, open source Apache Hadoop and some of the capabilities that uh, my team is responsible uh, for developing on top of that. The main point is this, you don't need a schema. In fact, that's the primary advantage of these Hadoop system technologies um, is that you can analyze a variety of information without enforcing a single schema. It's therefore really, really good at, at certain types of use cases where you want to discover an experiment where you're analyzing a variety of information that can't be easily or cost-effectively converted to one schema. Um, and it allows you that freedom uh, of analysis across those various you know, data types. So uh, to put some real examples on this, you know, we have customers that are analyzing information that's coming out of structured information uh, around their customers, <coughs> excuse me, like data warehouses and, and uh, master data management systems and combining it with uh, documents and PDFs and, and, and doing deeper relationship analysis on things that were uh, uncovered through text documents and then combining that back into you know, a structured system for further analysis. That's the type of, you know, that's one way uh, that you could think of you know, big data technologies. The same applies to uh, streams and, and um, streaming uh, analytics. We're analyzing a variety of information. Um, and in fact, the ability to, to, to analyze multiple types in their native format, so again, not converting it down to one structured relational system for analysis, that's 
that's a big hallmark of big data, and it's something that organizations are becoming very, very attracted to, the notion that this isn't just some way of pre-processing things and then ultimately putting it in a warehouse. You can perform the analytics in motion or on the variety of data in its native format. But that being said, there's lots of use cases out there where you do want a schema and a structure and all of the, the, the controls that that brings you know, with, with warehousing. So you're managing and planning and doing repetitive tasks over and over, monthly reporting. You want the controls and structures uh, of a data warehouse system. So uh, think back to those use cases in that slide that we covered. And, and that, again, helps to be a very good key and a legend for well, what technology or technologies do I need within that big data ecosystem. Great. And uh, Chris, um, any perspective from NASA on data schemas for big data? Sure, yeah. Um, I like sort of what David mentioned, you know, when he said uh, a lot of times with technologies like Hadoop, you don't need any one particular schema uh, because it kind of supports very flexibly, flexibly a lot of different types of data. Um, I would add to that that a lot of the domain-specific sort of science use cases do um, sort of center around the development of schemas. And what you find a lot is th in technology development is that a lot of times you're trying to be domain agnostic. So Hadoop, ODT, these, these, these sort of broad open source big data technologies, what they try and do is they try and say, well, look, we provide generic data management services independent of the domain. Um, so they can, as a platform, get you up and running very rapidly you know, they can get you up and running in, in, in sort of a general way. And then what they support is rapid and sort of iterative development and refinement of, of the model on top of that and the information model. And I think at NASA we see that a lot because a lot of our, I mean, we're entirely driven by science and the requirements and use cases that they come up with. And a lot of times in, when, they, when they start talking to us, sort of data science people um, or computer scientists, whatever you want to call it, uh, they're coming to us with their vocabulary and terminology, which when we translate that into data systems amounts to their schemas and their sort of understanding of the information. So as big data people and technologists, I think we need to be flexible and to build sort of generic ways of, of dealing with that and build technologies that can do that. But from a NASA perspective, um, the schema is extremely important and it's something that um, we, we can't get away from. There's just a lot of them. <laughs> Great. Um, thanks very much, both Chris and David, for a very informative uh, presentation there. Uh, we're coming to the uh, top of the hour here, so I think we'll uh, call it a day for this webinar. Uh, I'd like to also thank everyone for attending the webinar who's still on the, uh, on the call so far, and there are quite a few of you still there. Um, as I stated at the beginning of the session, all attendees will have access to the presentation material. Um, you will receive an email with a link to the material in about a week to 10 days from now, and you'll also be able to download the presentation yourself from that link. Um, the full presentation will also be posted on YouTube, and again, the link to that will be included in the email that you will be receiving. So uh, once again, thank you to everyone for attending this webinar. Uh, we look forward to uh, seeing you on the uh, other webinars that we've got planned, and we'll be signing off now.